السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين، والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أما بعد، what I basically said there in Arabic was in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, and may He extol and send blessings of peace upon His final messenger Muhammad and upon his family and those who follow them upon righteousness until the day of resurrection. So the title of the speech is, What is the Purpose of Life? And this is an important question. And it's not just the title of the speech, so for the sake of information, we can know what is the purpose of life. But it's an important question because it's linked to another important question. Once you know what is the purpose of life, that question leads you to another one, which is what will be my final destination? Or what is the end for me? And what does this mean to me? It's not just that we're here to know the purpose of life. Now, there have been a lot of people who have contemplated the purpose of life. And there have been a lot of philosophers historically who contemplated life itself. What is life? What is the answer? And some of them came with the conclusion that it's basically imagination. Others said, because of the fact that I think, I must exist. And so many people came up with different things. But in our contemporary world now, many people have contemplated the purpose of life. And so many of them have come to the wrong conclusion. There are actually people who thought of this question, and their answer was that the purpose of life is to make money. And we have met so many people who have thought of it like that, who have come to this conclusion that you're here to make as much money as possible and then buy whatever you can with your money and then provide with your money a good education for your children so then they can have a good income and they can make good money as well and so on and so forth. But of course that is not the purpose of life. That is not the purpose of life. And everything has a purpose. Everything, everywhere on earth, whether we know and understand what the purpose is or not, every little organism, every insect, something as annoying as a housefly, it has a purpose. So it can't be that everything around us has a purpose. If you look at this room, you will not find one metal or plastic object that they just put there for absolutely no reason. They just went out of their way to put this item and hang it on the wall or from the ceiling for absolutely no reason. Every single thing that surrounds human beings has a purpose. So it can't be that the human being, him or herself, doesn't have a purpose. Yet everything around them has a purpose. And I'm not going to hold you in suspense for 30 minutes before I finally tell you what is the purpose. It's very clear and it's very simple. And and Allah mentions it in the Qur'an, the Muslim holy book, where the purpose of life and the purpose that He created us is so that we may worship Him and worship Him alone. And that's as simple as it gets. And there is no complication there. Because the most important message has to be digestible, has to be clear, has to be understandable. It can't come to you coded, it can't come to you within the confines of a mystery because it's the most important message. So this is something that Allah wants us to know. And for those who don't know, the word Allah is a name. It's the name of God in Arabic. It's not the name of a different God. And a lot of times you'll find people trying to say that Allah is not the same God as the God of Abraham or the God of Moses, but actually that's not correct. And I always tell people, if you don't believe, you find a Bible in Arabic and you'll see that it says Allah. And all Christian Arabs, they say Allah. So when I say Allah for the purpose of this talk, it's just the name of God in Arabic. We're not talking about a different God. And if you hear me say in Arabic, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the name of a prophet, it means may Allah extol and send blessings of peace upon him. So it's a, it's a kind of respect that we pay to the prophets. So we were saying that everything has a purpose. It can't be that the human being doesn't have a purpose. The purpose of life is to worship the Creator. And so many people become confused with different things in life. And some people think that they were born to become an actor, or born to become a model, or born to rock and roll, born, born to become a singer, or born to 
to you know whatever it is, uh, extreme motorcycling or, or skydiving. These things come secondary to why Allah created you. The first and foremost reason we were put here on this earth to worship the Creator. But then so many things come in our path and they take us and pull us away from the purpose of our existence. So we are to worship Allah alone and to not associate anything with Him or alongside Him in worship. And that is the most important thing. And that is actually the worst crime is to worship someone else with Allah. The brother who just introduced me, Brother Ahmad, he said, you know, that, that I came all the way from Sudan and he made it because of his good manners. He made it sound like I am doing them a favor, but it's actually the, the other way around. They bring me, you know, wherever I am, they brought me once from Sudan, they brought me all the way from uh, Washington, D.C. And they're very nice to me. They give me the, sh the sheikh treatment, you know, where they call me in the morning, what do you want for breakfast? And they call me at lunch, what would you like to have for lunch? And they call me for dinner, what would you like for dinner? And they're being nice to me, do you need anything else? Can I get you some shampoo, mouthwash, whatever you need? They always give me this excellent treatment. And imagine now, after being here for, let's say, a total of two weeks that I'll spend in Calgary. After these two weeks, when it's time to really thank them, I walk up to a total stranger that I never met before, and I say, you know what, I'd like to thank you very much for buying my ticket all the way from Africa and my return ticket. I'd like to thank you for all the meals that you've paid for, for me. You know, for the lunch and for all the good, good times and all the respect that you gave me. Thank you very much. And I just thank, thank a total stranger that had nothing to do with this group that invited me over here. No one in this room feels that that's fair. No one feels that that would be proper. And if I were to give anyone in this room a thousand dollars, would you go and thank somebody else for it? Or would you thank the one who gave it to you? And that's why worshipping something besides Allah, no matter who or what it is, it is a severe, severe and major sin in Islam, but not just in Islam. You will find this message consistent and you will find this message to be there also in the Old Testament, even though I understand that Jews do not like this term Old Testament because to them it's not old, it's still a real deal. So, but you will find this message consistent in the Old Testament, it's consistent in the New Testament that you do not worship anything else besides God. And you do not worship anything else alongside with Him. Because He is the one that gives you everything that you have of good in this life. Everything that you have. And you can't put a price on the things that He gives you, the blessings that He gives you. I guarantee no one in this room would sell their two eyes, not even for a hundred million dollars. I can guarantee. Or even your hearing, or your ability to speak for that much money. Because you can't put a price on the blessings that Allah gives you. And in the Quran, Allah even mentions that if you were to try to count the blessings of Allah, you won't be able to enumerate them. And there's so many things that He gives us and they're blessings, but we take it for granted. We don't even consider them as blessings. So for example, some of you have very good hair. How many people wake up in the morning and just thank God for having good hair? Most people don't consider good hair as a blessing. Until you see someone with a hairstyle like me, then you're like, oh, thank God for my hair. <laughs> How many people remember to thank Allah for their teeth? That that's a blessing. They don't remember that. So many things around us, they're blessings from Allah. We can't put a price on them, we can't enumerate them. We can't count how many blessings we have from Allah. How many times do you wake up, how many times in your life have you woken up in the morning ill? You wake up with an illness and you call in, you can't go to work or you can't go to school. But how many days did you wake up in good health, not sick? And, you, and how many bad illnesses and how many potential illnesses did Allah push away from you? So that's again another way of looking at the blessings of Allah. So He gives you all these blessings. And in the end, when something good happens, you hear people say they thank other gods or they thank something else that they worship. How many times have you heard something good happen to someone and they'll say something like, thank you Jesus. Or they'll attribute it to something else other than Allah. Oh, this happened because of my good luck or good fortune. What is fortune? What is luck? No one knows what that is. You can't put a precise definition on it. But people 
rarely do they fall back on thanking Allah and attributing good that happens to them to Allah. And so that's why then shirk is such a, a major sin that Allah does all this for you and then you thank other than Him. Or you don't even thank Him, you attribute it to yourself. Well, ultimately, part of what you did was part of the reasoning behind why you got the good blessing or the good thing. But ultimately, it came to you from Allah. Because Allah could have had you switch places with someone else in another corner of the globe. And you could be in a dilapidated village with nothing and no wealth. But Allah chose to put you in this situation. So every good that happens to you ultimately comes from Allah. And so, therefore, because He is the one that gives us everything that we have of good, it makes sense to worship Him. It makes sense to thank Him and not anyone else alongside with Him. So let me explain why is it that we, we need God. And as people become self-sufficient, as people become stronger, as they become more proud of their se themselves, as they become arrogant, they feel less of a need to depend on Allah. Well, the truth is, no matter how rich or how poor you are, you still need Allah. And there is not anyone on the planet who is less of a slave of Allah than anyone else or is less in need of Allah than anyone else. So we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for certain reasons. But as people, as I said, when people are weak, and that's why historically you find the followers of prophets were of the first people that were usually of the poor, and they would be the first ones to follow the prophet. And as, as people become more arrogant, they feel, well, I don't need to worship God, or what do I need Him for? Well, He's the one who gives you everything that you have. And the need for God goes back to a number of things. First of all, a lot of people say things like, you know, I believe that there is a God. But I don't believe in organized religion. And I don't know if that means they would like to believe in a disorganized religion. But I don't believe in organized religion. There is a God. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to be good. And if I'm good, God will take me to paradise. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, the question is, what is good? What is good? Who determines what is good and who defines what is good? And I'll tell you from personal experience, I used to live for two years in a country in, in Central Africa. My father was stationed there and a country which shall remain unnamed. In that country, there was nothing wrong with stealing. It was not reprehensible and it was not punishable by law. There's nothing wrong with stealing whatsoever. So if you caught someone stealing in your home, there was no embarrassment, there's nothing wrong with it. If you wanted him to be punished for that, you had to pay the police to take him to jail. Even though he stole from you. You caught him wearing your suit and he had the fistfuls of your cash and your wife's jewelry and everything. But nothing was wrong with stealing in that society. And I'll tell you one time, we were in the marketplace with, uh, I was with the chauffeur and suddenly he started looking for his wallet. Someone had just stolen it or you know, there was a pickpocket in, in the vicinity. So he started looking for his wallet and then he found it in the hand of the pickpocket. So he takes it from the pickpocket as he's smiling. It was kind of like, you. <laughs> he takes the wallet from him and the pickpocket was like, you got me. <laughs> Not a problem. And everybody else was looking at this, they were observing this incident, and everybody was laughing. Like, yeah, he tried it, but you know, he got caught. And I was the only one looking and staring at everybody, are these people out of their mind? Are they crazy? Don't, what's, what's funny about this? But you know, nothing is wrong with stealing in that country. So much so that their president, he said in one of his speeches, he said, we don't steal, we borrow, but we just forget to ask permission. President saying this in a speech. And you have to pay the police to take the person to jail, and you have to bring them a meal every day in jail. So you have to cook. You know, what are you doing? I'm cooking up a stew for the guy, the poor guy that was stealing. And you have to drive to the jail every day and give him the meal. Why? Because in that society, they determine that there's nothing wrong with stealing. By the way, one time I explained this story in, in a community that was full of uh, people from different, various African nations. And during the break, every different person would pull me and say, were you speaking about the <laughs> 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 it, 
it, it turned out to be a number of African countries have the same exact thing, where there's nothing wrong with stealing, it's not reprehensible, it's not punishable by law. So then what do we see in this example? We see a society, a given society, they, they decided on a certain, uh, they took a certain issue or a certain value, and they said this is acceptable for the purposes of our community. One thing you kind of find to be universal is that universally, for the most part, human life is considered to be sacred. More, for the most part, wherever you go, you don't find anywhere where they consider killing a human being is the same as stepping on a hand, for example. So human life is sacred, but beyond that, it's a free-for-all. You find certain people, they take this certain value, and it's acceptable to them. And that thing is not acceptable to them. So in, in certain ancient cultures, pedophilia was okay, it was acceptable. And there was nothing wrong with it. So if you lived in that society, you could be a good person and you know, a part-time pedophile, but by your definition, you're a good person. And I give examples closer to home, where for example now, there are certain things in, in society, and at least I can speak for the United States, so that way I stay safe with the Canadians. In the United States, there are certain things that are not acceptable that have become replaced with euphemisms and they've been given a new definition and have become acceptable. So for example, you don't find young people in the state saying, well, I, I fornicated last night. They don't say that. They, you, they give a euphemism in its place. They make it sound good. They make it sound innocent. So what happens? We made love. So it's like we made hearts and Hallmark cards and little music and we just passed out love, you know. Very innocent, very nice. Or we slept together. Does it get any more innocent than that? She was over there, she slept, and I slept over here, and I dreamt of bunnies and bears. And it sounds so nice, but it's a euphemism. So now in society, that kind of thing is considered, you know, all right. Even certain things that are still frowned upon, we still have a nicer name for them. Like nobody says, you know, we committed adultery. We have an affair. It's an affair. It's still bad, but it's an affair. It's not adultery. You're not an adulterer. It's an affair, you know. It's on the side, you know. So, every society will pick certain things and say, well, this is good, and this is acceptable. So that means you can't have human beings by themselves to decide, I'm going to be a good person as long as I'm good, then God will take care of me. Because if you're in that African country where I used to live, you can be a very good person and the best crook in the neighborhood. But you might do something that you think is good, but it's actually reprehensible or horrendous in the sight of Allah. And that's why human beings need Allah to tell them right from wrong. Need Allah to tell us about these things. Because on our own, we can't even come, we can't come to an agreement and we can't really determine what is good and what is bad beyond the things that are, for the most part, universal. So, if there is a God, and a lot of times you hear people say, look, I believe there is a God, but I don't believe that there is a resurrection. I don't believe that we will be resurrected and we will be tried in the next life or anything like that. There is a God, He put us here on this earth, and you live once, so you live life to the fullest. Dance like no one is watching and all the other things, fancy things that people say. Just enjoy life, you live once, that's it. If there is a God, then we can guarantee for sure and 100% that if there is a God, then there has to be a day of resurrection. Because if there is a God and there is no resurrection, there is no reward and there is no punishment, that would imply that that God is unfair. It's unfair if there's no reward and no punishment. It's extremely unfair. So let's take a scenario. As this person claims that there is a God, but there is no resurrection. So let's take an example of one person who does good his or her entire life, constantly giving of their time and of their wealth to charity, always smiling and saying kind words, and doing so much for the community and for others and for the poor. And then that person dies and they go to earth. Now, they go to the earth, they bury there. According to this argument, there is no resurrection. Another person, a murderer, a killer, a thief, the worst human being possible, they kill thousands of people, and then this person dies, and they're buried on earth. There is no resurrection. 
Did they go to the same place? They went to the same place. They both buried on earth, and that's it. Nothing happens. No reward, no punishment. And this person claims that there is a God, and this God he must be knowledgeable, he must be powerful, he must be wise, he must be fair, he must be just. So how can he be fair and just and not reward and not punish? You know, even everyone in this room, we, we understand the concept of retribution. We understand that there has to be a reward for something good and a punishment for something evil. That's why we have courts, that's why we have prisons and justice systems. And that's why we have rewards and award ceremonies because we believe in rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. Even children understand this concept. Even they know when they do something wrong, they will be punished. But you might ask, or maybe you might argue, maybe the parents taught them that. But there are certain things, such as the concept of retribution, that animals and children understand without anyone giving them a lesson about it. And I always give the example, you can go to the Calgary Zoo, and you can offend the local monkey in its cage. And if you do something to offend the monkey, they will, they will get even with you. And they will fling something at you, and let me not be more descriptive than that. But do take a change of clothing and perhaps an umbrella. This monkey understands the concept of getting even with someone. And there are many other animals that do it. Uh, one of my favorite examples is one, of the, one bird that's referred to as the honey guide which guides you to honey. Whenever it finds a beehive, it will come to you and look you directly in the eye, and it starts to sing and flutter its wings and jump up and down, and so you follow it, it moves to the next branch, and it keeps guiding you to where there is a beehive, and the idea, the deal is that you're supposed to, and human beings, they use whatever techniques of smoke and so forth, and then they remove the honey, and they're, they're supposed to leave some for this bird, and it eats. But there are some people who are very mean-spirited, they eat the honey and then they throw it into the ground and they stomp it into the dirt. So the bird comes down and it finds nothing to eat whatsoever. But it's a very nice bird. It says, don't worry, I know where there's more honey. And it keeps looking you directly in the eye, fluttering its wings and singing and calling you. And you keep following it and following it until it will lead you to the territory of a dangerous animal that will attack you. <laughs> this is a bird. It understands the concept of retribution. The bird understands reward and punishment. You don't reward it by giving it the honey. It will punish you. And sometimes it leads you to a hole in the tree. You stick your hand in the badger or some other animal starts tearing at you and biting and scratching. This bird understands this concept. How can it be that the Creator in His wisdom and, his, and in His justice doesn't understand the concept of rewarding people for the good that they do and punishing people for the evil sins that they commit? And so therefore, there has to be a day of resurrection. And if there is a day of resurrection, that means that God has to let His truth be clear to us, His message be clear to us as well, so we can know how to avoid the hellfire and how to enter into paradise. The other thing why people need Allah and why people need God is that the human being is created out of the body and the spirit. Every one of us here, we're a combination body and the spirit. The Islamic explanation is that life is this relationship between the body and spirit. The minute the spirit leaves the body, that's the end of life. So because we're created of the body and the spirit, we have to take care of both. Not one, but both. The majority of people are only taking care of one. The majority of people are taking care of the body. How do you take care of the body? You eat, you drink, you sleep, you take care of the body. But then there is the spirit. And that's why you find people who have reached the epitome of taking care of the body, that they're very, very, yeah, very, very rich. They, they don't have to, let's say, go to work. They can sleep in if they like. They don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from or the next drink. They've actually taken care of and satiated all the needs of the body. Those people, they still find this emptiness inside. That emptiness is the need of the spirit. That's why you always find people believing in something. And even those who are atheists and don't believe in anything, most of the time you'll find that they believe in some kind of spirit, some kind of UFO, some kind of force, or some kind of unexplained phenomenon. Whatever they refer to it as, whatever, however they philosophize it. 
So that's because of the spirit that needs something. And this emptiness that people find, and I always reference this show that used to be uh, on television, it was called True Hollywood Stories. Anyone remember the, what else they would put in the title? They would say stories without the Hollywood ending. Because in Hollywood there's always the, you know, the right into the sunset and the, the good stuff. But they're talking about the lives of these musicians and, and uh, famous actors and actresses. And most of them, when you go through the biographies, the majority of them, they end up overdosing on drugs or choking on their vomit or something like that. So because after they took care of the body and everything, and they reached what they thought to be the purpose in life, they still found this emptiness. And so they try to fill this void with other things, with experimenting with different kinds of drugs, with alcohol, or with trying to keep themselves busy. So one weekend you're jumping off an airplane, next time you're going kayaking, after that you're diving, then you're skydiving, constantly trying to keep themselves busy to fill that gap, that void that they feel. But that void, as we said, is related to the fact that you have the spirit, and the spirit needs something to believe in. And that's why, as some people, as some claim that 96% of the world's population believe in a creator. In one way or another, they believe in a creator. Because of this need to believe in something. So, there is a creator. We're in need of, of worshipping. We're in need of fulfilling the spirit. And there is a day of resurrection. And so we said the purpose of life is to worship the Creator. And that is linked to the final destination of people. Allah, as I would describe in the Quran, how the day of judgment has drawn near. The day of judgment has come near. And we said there has to be a day of judgment. There has to be reward and punishment. People have to be accountable for their deeds. I always mention one a fairly popular report in the United States who started to become an atheist and then after a week of firmly believing that there is no God she went back to believing that there is a God because of the concept of retribution because of justice she started to just repeat to herself over and over and over again so Hitler just died? Hitler just died? and she just kept repeating it over and over again it made no sense to her that he would be responsible for killing so many people, but nothing happens to him. He got off very easy, actually. There's no punishment whatsoever. So it can't be that there is no resurrection. And there is no justice there. And there's nothing fulfilling there. And that's why in Islam, and when you study the teachings of Islam, you will find things that you would think to be the least linked to the Day of Judgment. For example, the Prophet وسلم, he said in the hadith, which is uh, one of his sayings, he says, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, meaning the day of judgment, he should honor his guest. What does honoring the guest have to do with that? For whoever believes in Allah and the last day, he should say that which is good, or he should keep silent. And of course, he means she as well, either or. So what does that have to do with the last day? It has everything to do with it. Because we, you believe then, because there is a day of resurrection, you will be asked about your deeds, you will be asked about what you say and what you do. And that's why it's all linked to the day of judgment. Even honoring your guests, you will get reward for that. And if you're, if you're rude to people, and if you lie, and if you backbite, and you, if you spread rumors and tales, you will be held accountable for that. That's why everything is linked to the day of judgment. And there is no motivation Nothing to motivate people to be good if there was no day of judgment. And nothing to, to stop anyone from stealing if you're not going to be held accountable. If you live life once, then why doesn't everyone just do whatever they do and you're not going to be punished for it? And so this is one of the problems that we're facing, and again, I'm only going to speak for the United States. This is a problem we're facing in the United States with moving away from the belief in God and the more you get into secularism, people always question morality. But they don't question immorality. I want you to pay attention to that. You don't have to believe me. I would like you to test it for yourself. People always question morality, but they don't question immorality. So when you say, don't use the bad, this bad word or that bad word, they say it's freedom of speech. And what's wrong with this bad word? And so on and so forth. So they question you when you say, don't speak like this in public. It is not civilized. It is not proper. Well, who's to say what is civilized? 
Who's to say what is proper? They question you, but they never question themselves. Who's to say that it's right for me to walk around and curse left and right like that? And who's to say that I have to force other people to listen to this garbage that's spewing out of my mouth? Why don't they question that? But everyone wants to question these things. And you've probably seen the campaign that's going around town. It was in the UK a few, few weeks ago. The, the, the big sign on the bus that says there probably is no God. So don't worry. And it's interesting how to say there probably is no God. So you're calling people to something based on something you're not even certain of. So you're saying, hey everybody, act like a fool because maybe, maybe there is no God. If there is, we don't know each other, okay? <laughs> so Allah tells us in the Quran that the day of judgment has drawn near. It has come close, but people, they are busy with other things. They are taken by the glitter of this world. It has taken them, and I, I'm going to pick on the iPhone again as I was picking on it this morning. You know, people, they forget the purpose. They see the glitter, they see the little things. And so, you find a young person and their main goal for the next three months is just to get the iPhone. And all he wants is the iPhone. And he has it on his desktop and just stares at it, tries to touch the screen. <laughs> and he sees someone with an iPhone. <laughs> Can I make a call, please? It's the iPhone. And I also picked on the Gucci handbag. This is just my opinion, you don't have to agree. It's an extremely ugly handbag. <laughs> it is a cloth handbag with G's all over it. That's it. G's, G, G. It is so ugly. But it's Gucci. <laughs> so people are taken with these things. Their whole life they're trying to get this handbag. If they can't afford it, they get the knockoff. They're trying to get this design and that design. And they see some celebrity wearing their jeans backwards. Suddenly, all these young people are wearing their jeans backwards. And they see this new phone and they want it so badly. And they sell things and they work extra and night shift and graveyard, graveyard to buy it. And then after three months, they're bored with it. They get something else. You know something? I, I grew up around the world. I grew up in Europe and in Asia and certain parts, in certain parts of Africa. And I was amazed when I finally settled in the United States some 13 years ago. I was amazed by the concept of the walk-in closet. I had never seen something like that before in my life. Everywhere I lived before, you open your closet, the closet always consisted of some shelves, perhaps a drawer or two, and you put everything there. It was big enough to put your clothes in it. I was so amazed when I saw people with a closet so huge that they could fit in it. Their whole body could fit in it. And you walk in and you're surrounded by clothing everywhere you look. T-shirts, all kinds of things, and suits and dresses. And in the end, what's the conclusion? I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> so it was amazing for me to see that people could have so many clothes and so many outfits and for every type of weather. They've got an outfit and if the sun is partly cloudy, they've got this environment to go. And According to their mood, they wear pink, they think they're polka dots, and all kinds of things. And fashion, and phones, and, and then, you know, these little gadgets that you're told that you need, and you don't need, and you're surviving very nicely without them. And all these gadgets that save you time, but in the end, you're so busy, you don't have time for anything. <coughs> the glitter of this world has taken us away from the purpose of life. By the way, I'm not calling that anyone leaves, you know, the minute that, you know, you need to become Muslim, so you go home break your iPhone, punch through your laptop screen, you know, destroy your car, and then that's it. We're not saying that. But we're saying everything with moderation. And Islam, one of the beautiful things about it, it teaches moderation. Everything should be moderate. Everything should be moderate. Your way of life is Islam. And it's linked to your worship of Allah. And that's why you find worship in every part of the Islamic religion. When you put on your clothing, there's a little prayer for that. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you remember Allah. Even as you're just looking at yourself, because the mirror time, it's you time, right? It's me time. You're looking in the mirror, you give yourself the wink and the gun. You're looking at yourself from different angles, you're so happy about it. Even at that point, the prayer for looking in the mirror says, Oh Allah, just as you have completed my physical appearance, completes my manners, my internal my manners, my characteristics. 
my mannerisms. Even then you're remembering Allah at the time when you most be thinking and focusing of your, on yourself, you're remembering Allah. So you see worship in every act, act or aspect of life in Islam because you're constantly reminded of what is the purpose of life and all these other things come secondary. So yes, now I have to go back and say yes, get the iPhone, it's not a problem. Get the Gucci bag, even though it just has G's on it and that's not really a useful sentence. I would prefer if the Gucci handbag said, this purse cost me $400. That's a useful statement, but it's just G's, you know? And maybe zeros are more attractive than G's, you know, but we can debate that. So the point is, Islam is not saying leave off everything. And I know a lot of people sometimes think of it that way. And even sometimes Muslims get confused like that. One time someone pulled me aside and said, look, I had a laptop, I used to love it so much, I was afraid the laptop would take me away from Allah, so I broke it. I said, next time something takes you away from Allah, please give it to me first. <laughs> but it's not required of you to break something, and a laptop isn't really going to take you away from Allah. It's not like you're going to start bowing to the laptop. No. OHP, <laughs> or whatever. So the point is, as Allah warns us in the Quran, that the day of judgment has drawn near. But people, they're still busy with the glitter of this world. They're just running after little things here and there that they believe will make them happy. And after they get them, there's still that emptiness inside. There's still that emptiness inside. You know something? Every time a new car comes out, I tell them, I've never owned a brand new car, by the way. Every time a new car comes out, I tell myself, you know, I'm just going to go buy that car. I love it. It's great. I'm just going to go buy it. And then I don't for financial reasons, <laughs> but in the end, three months later, I don't like it anymore. Or six months later, I would say to myself, you know, I'm so glad I didn't buy the 07 model because the 08 is so gorgeous. I'm happy I didn't do that. And then the 08, you love it, you want to get it, and the 09 looks better. And you know what? So you would think that if I get this car, I'll be so happy. But maybe after seven months, I'm like, man, now I'm stuck making payments for five years. I can't even look at other cars to lower my gaze from other cars. <laughs> so, we will be overtaken by the glitter of this world and the things that attract us and the things that we feel will make us happy or that we will make ourselves believe these things will make us happy. Well, the truth is, true happiness is in the worship of Allah. And that's why you see people around the world and those of you who have traveled a lot, you have probably seen people with, in comparison to what we have, nothing. But they're so happy. And you've seen people who live in affluent neighborhoods and very rich people with the best cars and the best homes and swimming pools and so on and so forth, and yet they're unhappy. And it's interesting, and again, I'll pick on the states, even though deep down I feel there's no difference. I shouldn't have said that. But I'll pick on the states where in, in the majority of affluent neighborhoods, you have the highest percentage of people going to the shrink and you know, the wife has got this with the shrink and the, the, the young man is into this kind of problems and the girl is seeing a psychiatrist as well. So then they'll say things like, you know, this person, he's a successful person, but his wife had a nervous breakdown. His daughter, uh, his, his son is in jail, his daughter is going to the shrink, you know, and he has mental issues. Excuse me, how is he successful exactly? How is he, is he successful with all these problems? Successful means he's got money, he's got a car, he's got a home. You know, he's got all these things, his bank account, you know, is, he doesn't have minuses, you know. Like uh, my bank, my bank is uh, Bounce of America, by the way. Because my checks are bouncing all the time. Alright, so the point is, thank you sir, Hamlet, thank you. These young men appreciate the jokes, yeah. You know when your day of judgment begins? Because there is the, the collective day of judgment, but yours begins when you die. And there's no doubt that everyone in this room is going to die. There's no doubt. I don't think any sane person in here believes that there's a day when they will not die. We all know, no, we do believe that, but there's, none of us believe that there's a day, that there won't be a day when we die. Because we all die. Even if someone in here has some kind of outrageous hope that, you know, I'm going to freeze myself and one day they will stick me in a giant microwave and then I'll be revived again. Even that person knows that they're going to die. So if we're going to die, and we know that there's a resurrection, 
What do we have to show for the day of resurrection? Because it has drawn near. And no one knows when they're going to die. Most people believe that they will die, you know, when they're on their deathbed, and all their children and their grandchildren are circled around them. And then they will say some very well-organized words of prose that are filled of wisdom, filled with wisdom, and then suddenly they pass away. Everybody would like it to be that romantic, but we don't know when we're going to die. Some people will die within the month, some people will die within a year. Is it fair to assume that no one in this room will die a year from now? Is it fair to assume that? But everyone right now feels it's not going to be that. Everyone right now, when I said that, you said, look at the guy next to you, like, feel sorry for him. <laughs> it's not going to be me. But you know what? It could be you. The early Muslims used to say, the angel of death overlooked you, overlooked you to take the souls of your brothers. And one day, he will come to you and overlook others. What do you do when that day comes? How do we answer Allah Azza wa Jalla? What do we say to Allah? Because every single one of us will stand in front of Allah and will be asked about the words that we use, the things that we did. We will be asked about that. And only those whose good deeds outweigh their bad deeds will be the ones who enter paradise. But what if you, th you thought you were doing good deeds, but they weren't good deeds in the sight of Allah, they were good deeds in the sight of your given community? What then? And we understand and we know that three things will fall into your grave. And I always like to remind people of that. Three things will fall into your grave. Your family and your wealth and your good deeds. But once they bury you and they put you in the ground, your family will come back to fight over your good deeds. And you have nothing left to fight over your money, your wealth. And you have nothing left except your good deeds. And so then, the purpose of life is to worship the Creator. But it is to worship Him in how He wants to be worshipped. Because we've heard people make the argument that there are as many ways to God as there are souls on earth. And many people accept that. But the problem is that, first of all, that is an assumption and a statement made by somebody. It is not backed by any scripture. It is not backed by anything specific. The second thing is that how can it be that everything in this world is organized? Those of you who are computer programmers or chemists or engineers, you know that there's a system to do everything. There's a way, there's a, a pattern, and there's a technique. But when it comes to finding your way to God, everybody can do it however they like. This guy thinks that he'll go to paradise if he swallows a live frog every Wednesday morning. This guy thinks he can do it through this way, through that way. This group says we're going to kneel, kneel down. This group says we're going to hang upside down. And everyone thinks they can reach God their own way. So out of the fairness of God is that He shows us what is the truth. And I know a lot of people think that how can I know where is the truth? There's so many religions on earth right now. And I can't tell which is the truth. I don't know if it's Islam. I don't know if it's Judaism or Christianity or Buddhism or Taoism or Jainism or Zoroastrianism. How do I know where is the truth? And remember what we said in the beginning. We said God is fair and He's just. It can't be that He's fair and He's just and He makes His religion blend in amongst the falsehood. If there's one truth, it has to stand out clear. Allah says in the Quran, فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ What is besides the truth, except that it's falsehood? Meaning, if it's not the truth, it's not, it's falsehood. It can't be that there's more than one truth. That there's one God, and that's true. And there are twenty gods, and that's also true. And there are three gods, and that's also true. There's one truth. And that would imply that the rest are not true. So, how do we know where the truth is? We'll take another analogy. If I give you 10 essays and I tell you one of these essays was written by Shakespeare and the other nine were written by second graders, are you telling me it would take you a long time to determine which is which? You're going to come up with, okay, I'm not sure which one it is, but I've got these two, so I'm not sure which is Shakespeare, the one about me and mommy playing in the park all day, or this strange one that's titled Oct Hello. Who would know which one? Shakespeare wrote. It's very clear. So are you telling me, for the sake of argument, let's say there are 3,000 religions on earth, 
If one is from Allah, and 2,999 are a combination of being from devils, from con men, and all kinds of other things, I can't tell which is the one from Allah versus the one written by a devil or a con man or what have you. It can't be that the work of Allah looks just like the work of the devil. And I know a lot of people are confused and they think, well, who knows who has the truth? And Muslims are very sure of who has the truth. Because we looked at it analytically. And one of my personal, I'm showing a, showing a personal thing with you, one of, one of my fa favorite and personal things in Islam is that the Qur'an calls you to contemplate the Qur'an itself. Contemplate this book itself. Is it, could it have been written by a human being? Or is it strong enough to have you so you can safely and accurately assume or claim that it was written, that it was from Allah Azza That it has no contradictions whatsoever. That it has no discrepancies. That it has no solutions for problems that don't, that the solutions don't work themselves. So, the Qur'an calls us to think and to contemplate. And the Muslims in the room right now, the majority of them, if not all, they have contemplated and they're sure of, of the clear truth that stands out. And that's why there are so many people who read the Qur'an and they immediately recognize that it's not a normal book, that it couldn't have been written by man. And there's so many things that this is not the time for it, nor does the time permit, so many things that if you stack them one on top of the other, you will see that it's impossible for any human being, no matter how brilliant, to have written such a book 1400 years ago. Now this, to some of you, might seem like an outrageous claim, but the answer is very simple. There are Qurans and they're free at the back of the room on these tables. I'm telling you it is the book of Allah and it has absolutely no mistakes. So it would seem that it's easy for you to disprove me and so that means then, the test lies in you getting a copy of the Qur'an and reading it and looking at it analytically. Does this look like the writing of a normal human being? And so, uh, perhaps it's best to start to conclude. And I would like to mention again the most important things in Islam. And these most important things that I'm going to mention, they don't cause you any friction and if they agree with you, you basically have the ingredients of what it takes to become a Muslim. The first and most important thing in the Qur'an, and because it's the most important message in the Qur'an, you will find it on every single page of the book. That there is only one God, and He is the only one that should be worshipped. The worst sin is to worship something besides Him, or to worship something alongside with Him. So that is the number one thing. So these are called the five pillars of Islam and as you know, pillars are what hold up a foundation. So these are what hold up Islam. One, that there is only one God worthy of worship, nothing else should be worshipped and nothing else is worthy of worship. And that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. Not his right hand man, not his helper, not an angel, his servant and his messenger. And he is a man who came with the same message of all the prophets before him. All the prophets, whether you look at them in the Old Testament or the New Testament, or whether you look at the stories of the prophets through the Qur'an, you will find that all of them call to the worship of one God. And this has been mentioned so many times in the Old Testament. All you have to do is just go to Bible.com and just look up the word idols. And see how many times God will, will threaten, and that is the accurate word, threatening David and Solomon and, and the people and the prophets and nations from worshipping something besides him. So that's a message that you find consistently throughout the Old Testament. Then you look at the message of Jesus and he also didn't change the Ten Commandments, the most important things, you honor your parents, you're good to your neighbors, you don't steal, you don't lie. But they asked him, what is the first commandment? And he said, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. If you look at all the sentences spoken by Jesus in the Bible, just what Jesus said, not what people explained, you will find constantly and consistently that He is calling people to worship God. Not once, not once does He clearly or explicitly say you need to worship. Not once. He says, and worship the Father who is in heaven. A woman calls Him good teacher, why callest thou me good? Why do you call me good? It's only the Father who is good. 
So you don't walk away with the message that he was the third Godhead or that he needs to be worshipped. Not explicitly. You will find vague hints to the Trinity. But vague hints cannot be acceptable when it comes to the most important message. The most important message in the Quran is the oneness of Allah. It's on every single page of the book. If I give you a booklet, How to Fix a Flat Tire, you read the whole thing, it has to address the topic, How to Fix a Flat Tire, clearly and explicitly. But what if you read the whole thing and there's only a hint, a vague hint to How to Fix a Flat Tire? That doesn't work. So how can it be that the most important message is whatever it is, John 3.16, or the, the propitiation of the Lord's anger through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, or whatever, how can that be the most important message that He is divine and He came to die for people's sins, but it's not there, clearly and explicitly. How many times did He give speeches in, in, on the roadside, in people's homes, in the temple? How many times did He give sermons? Not once did He say, listen up people, it's very clear. I am the third Godhead, I am divine, you need to worship me. So the message has to be clear and explicit, and we cannot accept vague hints to Trinity, because it's the most important message, it cannot be vaguely alluded to. It has to be clearly mentioned. And so when you look at the, old, the teachings of the Old Testament, and you look at the teachings of the New Testament, you will find constantly that there is one God. I am your Lord, besides me there is no God. And then you look at the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's the same exact message. The Ten Commandments don't change, and it's one God that is worthy of worship. And you find that the Quran mentions all the other prophets, and mentions their names, and mentions the events in their lives. And if this book were written by an imposter who pretended to be a prophet, then he would spend the majority of the book talking about how great he was and talking about himself, and not talking about other prophets. Jesus is one of the top five of the greatest prophets in Islam. And it's no joke, and you cannot pick and choose from issues of belief. Islam is very strict in issues of belief, more flexible in issues of dealings and worship. In issues of belief, it's very strict. Out of the 1.2 billion Muslims on earth, if one of them today stood up and said, I don't believe in Jesus, or I believe in all the prophets, but I, I don't like Solomon, then he's not a Muslim, or she's not a Muslim anymore. It's not like they're 98% Muslim. It takes them out of the fold of Islam. So, an imposter, why would he make that a stipulation in his made-up religion? That you have to believe in these other men who came, versus you just have to believe in me, which is what an imposter would do. So you find, again, the consistent message of one God, also in the Quran that all the prophets came from the same place. That if, now if, I, if I were to take you back some thousands of years ago, suppose someone says, yes, this is the time of Jesus, all right? So Jesus was right there in front of him, and he's a prophet sent by Allah to teach people. And he says, well, I choose to follow Solomon. He was a prophet of God, so I'm following Solomon. They tell him, but God sent you a prophet right now. He's here on earth now, today, and his message is here, and he was sent for you. Yes, but I know that they came from the same place. I mean, they all came from God. So I'm just going to stick to, the, to what Solomon did. Can you ignore the prophet that Allah sent for you, even though you were following one of the prophets of Allah? Surely you were. But this one was sent now with the new message, with the latest version. And you're going to say, no, I'm going to fall back on the old teaching. And so many people are doing that right now. Where they believe in the true message of Jesus, or they believe in the, the current message of Jesus, or various different messages as people interpret them differently, but they refuse to follow the new prophet that was sent to them 600 years after Jesus, with the same message, message but some things were abrogated. And the way to pray and all these details are in the new message, but they say, no, I'm going to choose to follow this message. And that's why if you look at it, the Jews, they believed in everybody from Adam, and including Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Abraham, Lot, but they stop at Jesus. They don't follow, they don't believe in Jesus. But then the Christians did a better job, and they believed in everybody from Adam, including all the list of prophets we mentioned, and they believed in Jesus, but they stopped at the Prophet Muhammad. And then the Muslims do a better job, believing in everybody, including Jesus and including Muhammad. Because he was a prophet of Allah sent to you.
sent to you. The message of the Quran is to all of humanity. Wherever you're from and whoever you are, that's a message sent to you. It's where Allah tells you how He wants to be worshipped and how you should worship Him. And He tells you the rules of this world, the do's and the don'ts, and He warns you of the day of resurrection, which is a day that everybody in this room and outside of this room will experience. So the first of the five pillars is that you believe and you worship Allah alone, that He is the only one worthy of worship, and that the Prophet Muhammad is His servant and His messenger. After that then, it comes the prayer, and you pray five times a day, and this is the least that you can do. And it only takes moments out of your day, and it's not really a disruption of your daily routine. It's actually the highlight of your daily routine. Because we were put on earth to worship the Creator. So it doesn't make sense that we go through the entire day, not once thinking of the Creator, and then praying that we were here to worship the Creator. So five times a day you worship Him alone, and that makes sense. So He's the one that gives you everything that you have. And then after that, there is a small percentage that you give out of your yearly savings, not earnings, but 2.5%. So if you save $1,000 in the bank for over a year, you give $25 to the poor. That's it. And I guarantee no one in this room is that stingy, that they don't want to give $25 out of 1000 And I guarantee that everybody in this room gives a lot more than that every year. That's all that's required of you. The third is there is the lunar month of Ramadan, and most of you are aware of it. And this is one month during the year when you try to put your effort and do your best into being good, being well-mannered, watching what comes out of your mouth, and you fast, which is the physical side of it, but the most important part of it is what comes, you know, what happens during the month, your worship, you excel in worship for just this one month. And I'm sure no one in the room has any problem with worshiping Allah after all the good that He does for us. Spend one month out of the year in worship. Allah could have chosen six months out of the year, but it's just one. And then, the last thing is the Hajj journey, the pilgrimage that you make to Mecca. Once a lifetime if you're physically and financially able. That's it. These are the five most important things in Islam. So if these five things did not turn you off and they did not scare you away, then you actually now have agreed with what makes you a Muslim. So now you have the ingredients of what it takes to become a Muslim and do not think that this will be a departure from the teachings of Jesus. This is actually in line and the continuation of what all the prophets came with. And uh, so perhaps with that it's, uh, it's best to end here, as well as to leave time for, uh, for questions and answers. I would like to thank all of you uh, for your attentive listening. I would like to uh, encourage all of you to, to talk to the Muslims around you, those who are wearing the green shirt that says, what is the purpose of life? Ask them about Islam. Uh, take books as free material and don't let it you know, don't let your bills and your work and your exams and papers take precedence over the most important thing which is the purpose of life. But obviously before I leave, I would like to ask, who would like to become a Muslim right now? For the non-Muslims in the audience. I need the brave soul to take the first step. Who's going to do that? Okay, who would like to do it later and not put their hand up right now? Put your hands up. <laughs> okay, great. So what we'll do, please uh, you know, look into it more. Please talk about it more. And uh, there's a lot of material in the back. And those of you uh, who, who agreed with the five pillars of Islam, who agreed with the basic message that we have spoken about today, you actually have the ingredients of a Muslim. So it doesn't make sense for you to not accept Islam if you believe that only one God should be worshipped, that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was probably one of the Prophets of Allah, since he came with the same basic message as all the Prophets before him, and he fits the mold of a Prophet in his teachings, and in his actions, and in his sayings. And so, if you have come that close, then it would be a shame to not become a Muslim. And do not let anything else deter you from that. But again, I'd like to thank you for attentive listening. And may Allah extol and send blessings of peace upon His final messenger Muhammad. So Allah Muhammad wa Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.